All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, to the first installment of the 2016 SBA Lecture Series. It gives me great, great pleasure uh, to introduce one of our, our own to give a speech, to give a presentation about the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you Ms. Charlotte Craven. Hi, my name is Charlotte, and I'm here to discuss the Iran, Iran nuclear deal as international law. The American Heritage Dictionary defines international law as a set of laws that govern relations between countries as established by custom and agreement. Usually these agreements are through the consent of the parties to the agreement. They are often the culmination of years of history between the countries. One such example is the nuclear deal between Iran and the P5 plus one. <coughs> Excuse me. The P5 plus one is also called the E3 plus three, and it is the five permanent countries of the UN Security Council, which are the US, Russia, China, France, Great Britain, plus Germany. This nuclear deal is officially titled the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The most pertinent history for our purposes starts with the Iranian Revolution. The beginnings of the revolution started after a decade plagued by economic instability and social repression. The ruler at the time was backed by the US. His name was Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, and his government increasingly became the tar target of violence and opposition. At the urging of President Carter, to improve his regime's human rights record, the Shah released many political prisoners. This opened the door for even more opposition, and writers, lawyers, teachers, and students began demanding reform in their respective fields. Shortly after this surge in opposition, Mostafa Khomeini, the son and head advisor of exiled opposition leader Ayatollah Khomeini, was found dead. The cause of death was officially announced as a heart attack. But members of the opposition groups blamed the death on the Shah's police force, which is called the Sabak. The Shah's perceived association with Mustafa Khomeini's death caused many wise, even more widespread protests. After protests broke out over the death of Ayatollah's son, a government agent released an article attacking Ayatollah Khomeini as a traitor. This caused even caused even more mass demonstrations by students in the city of Qom. The Iranian police responded with violence, and some of the student protesters were killed. There was a 40-day mourning period per Shiite custom, and on the 40th day, there were more protests and more deaths. This resulted in a cycle where deaths resulted in more demonstrations, and at these demonstrations, more pr pr protesters died. The Shah, in an attempt to, to gain some control, declared martial law, which resulted in more attacks on demonstrators. From Iraq, where the Ayatollah had been staying during his exile, he advised opposition forces to continue in their attempts to undermine the Shah. The Shah used his power to have Ayatollah Khomeini banished from Iraq, so Ayatollah moved to Paris, where he found even more freedom to guide the protesters. Under his guidance, many workers went on strike. The opposition made demands, calling for Sabah, who had been killing protesters, to be disbanded and end to the martial law that was creating more violence and for the Ayatollah to be allowed to return to Iran. The Shah tried to ward off the demise of his reign and power by swearing to make changes and to demonstrate this, arrested members of his own regime. These attempts failed, and in January of 1979, he and his family left Iran, calling it a vacation, and refusing to admit his reign was over. The next month, the Ayatollah returned to Iran, 
with over a million Iranians flooding the streets to welcome him. The Ayatollah immediately began making changes. He exiled the Prime Minister and declared that Iran was now the Islamic Republic of Iran. Following these changes, he removed women from their positions in the judiciary. He began requiring them to wear a hijab, and he ordered public separation of the sexes. The Ayatollah created the Revolutionary Guard, which was an Islamic militia, who then spent much of 1979 enforcing these new Islamic laws. The Iranian opposition forces to the Shah held deep U.S. sentiments and started to resist against Western influences in Iran. Western educated Iranians fled the country to avoid persecution, and the backlash came to a head in November when the Iran hostage crisis occurred. During the hostage crisis, students stormed the U.S. Embassy and took the people there hostage. They demanded the Shah, who was in the U.S. for cancer treatment, to be extradited to Iran. The hostages were held for 444 days and were finally released on the day of Ronald Reagan's inauguration, which was January 20th, 1981. This began the decades-long sanctions against Iran by the U.S. The sanctions that were imposed in response to the hostage crisis included an oil embargo, the freezing of Iranian assets under U.S. jurisdiction, and a ban on travel by U.S. citizens to Iran. In 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini died. He was succeeded as supreme leader by Iranian President Ali Khamenei. He distinguished himself from the Ayatollah by bringing powers of the presidency with him into his position as supreme leader. Over the next 15 years, into the early 2000s, other Islamic religious leaders questioned his power to make Islamic laws, but Khamenei was able to retain his position as supreme leader. In 2005, an unknown candidate for president, mayor of Tehran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, was elected with the support of Khamenei. He ran on the promise to tackle poverty and social justice, and after the election, he was an outspoken supporter of Iran's nuclear program. Under President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace program, the U.S. helped to start Iran's nuclear program. This happened before the Iranian Revolution. The goal of Adams for Peace was to find peaceful uses for nuclear energy. The U.S. intended to invest in Iran's private industries that use nuclear energy. They signed a contract where the U.S. will lease uranium and reactors to Iran, and Iran signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which aimed to stop the advancement of nuclear weapons across the globe. Parties to the treaty would be under the oversight of the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA. In the 1970s, when the Iranian Revolution began, the West removed its backing of Iran's nuclear program, which caused it to fall apart. Iran didn't show interest in rebuilding until the mid-1980s. In the 1990s, with Ayatollah Khamenei in power, Iran began re rebuilding its nuclear program. It entered into a contract with Russia, where Russia would complete construction on two nuclear reactors. The Clinton administration unsuccessfully attempted to get Russia to call off the agreement. In the early 2000s, it was discovered that Iran had nuclear facilities that it had not disclosed to the IAEA. Um, the IAEA lacked hard evidence showing that these facilities were being used to produce nuclear weapons, but Iran's secrecy about them implied that it was. The International Atomic Energy Agency issued a report stating that Iran was not compliant with the terms of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which resulted in pressure from the international community and Iran's temporary halt on enrichment activities. Two years later, however, Iran resumed enrichment. President Ahmadinejad called Iran a nuclear state, and in 2009, Iran declared its intention to increase enrichment levels. The next year, a new IAEA report came out stating that Iran had not participated in efforts to verify its nuclear program was peaceful. So, in the, in the late 2000s, recently, in 2013, the P5 plus one in Iran began negotiations toward interim agreement. 
regarding Iran's nuclear program. And on December 24th, a deal was struck and the joint plan of action was adopted. Under this interim plan, Iran will halt its nuclear advancements. It would allow increased inspection by the IAEA. And in return, it would gain access to some of its frozen assets. <clears throat> With this plan in place, the parties could begin talks on a long-term solution. After 20 months of negotiation due to numerous extensions, a long-term deal was finally struck on July 14th of last year, which was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And this is a video explaining clearly what the terms of this agreement were. Negotiators from Iran and the six big world powers have just emerged from months of negotiations in Austria and Switzerland to announce that, believe it or not, they have an Iran nuclear deal. Every pathway to a nuclear weapon is cut off. But what does that actually mean? How does all that actually work? Well, this gets technical really fast, but it helps if you go through and look at some of the most important issues. One of the big ones is uranium. That's the stuff dig it out of the ground, use it for nuclear fuel, for a power plant, or even for a bomb. The deal requires Iran to give up 97% of its enriched uranium, almost all of it, down to just a 300 kilogram stockpile, not very much. Uranium comes in different levels of enrichment, but this restriction is really severe. Iran is only allowed to have its uranium up to 3.67% enrichment. And to give you a sense of what that means, medical research grade uranium is enriched to 20% and weapons grade uranium is enriched to 90%. So Iran's uranium is going to be weighed down at 3.67%, very safe in energy grade and not something that is anywhere near what can be used for a nuclear weapon. Iran is going to give up most of its centrifuges. It's going to go from 20,000 centrifuges to just 5,000 that are spanning thistle material plus another 1,000 that it can use for uh, research and development but can't use fissile material. And if Iran decided one day, you know what, we don't like this deal anymore, we're going to build a bomb, it would take a really long time to do it. And that gets to another really important issue, and that's inspections. Inspections and monitoring are how we make sure that Iran is sticking to their end of the deal and that they're not cheating. The inspections that the U.S. got out of this deal are frankly just astonishing. A one arms control analyst said he thought there was, quote, almost a 100% chance that if Iran cheated, it would be caught by these inspections. That's how good they are. So what does Iran get for accepting all of this? What Iran gets is relief from the economic sanctions that have been just crippling its economy. But what these sanctions do is they cut off Iran's economy from the outside world. They cut it off from international banking, international finance. These have been just devastating Iran's economy. They are really desperate to get out from under these. And this is a big deal, not just for Iran the state, but for the 77 million people of Iran, who is a big middle class, and they've been suffering under economic sanctions for too long, and they will finally get to have a chance at having a real economy, hopefully very soon after this. Resolution 2231 was the official resolution by the UN endorsing the JCPOA. It was adopted on July 20th, 2015, and outlined how sanctions against Iran would be reinstated should that be necessary. Um, chapter 7 of the UN Charter makes resolutions with respect to threats to peace, breaches of peace, and acts of aggression binding international law. Since Resolution 2231 adopted the JCPOA, which has the purpose of minimizing Iran's threat to peace. It was adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter and is therefore binding international law. Lastly, um, my opinion about the JCPOA is that since it mandates that Iran be subject to these strict inspections, and there's a provision for non-compliance which, which would enable the prior sanctions to snap back into place, 
then I think the agreement is a good thing, a good long-term solution because it allows for a significant decrease in Iran's nuclear, nuclear capabilities, as you saw in the video. And it has a backup plan if they don't comply, which obviously Iran has a history of not listening. So, the end. Right now we're going to open it up uh, briefly for questions. questions? No. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Um, with the, 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 the agreement that's been in place, I know that there was arguments about how uh, certain parts of the agreement weren't actually binding to the United States or to the various parties who signed on to the resolution, uh, even though it is in international law, uh, actually being able to uh, hold the United States or other parties accountable for their part of the deal. I've, I've been reading and been hearing that there have been issues with that. Could you clarify that? Well, as far as the United States is concerned, when Congress, uh, they didn't ad officially adopt it, but they declined to um, refuse it. Uh, yeah. They, so, in essence, they did adopt it by declining to oppose it. And since that happened, um, the U.S. is bound by it. Because, I mean, it is, a, it is, in essence, a treaty. It's not called a treaty, but it is. And as far as the other um, countries are concerned, I'm not sure if their governments did the same thing or not. But also, since it was adopted under Chapter 7, if, um, there, if, some, if a country doesn't comply, then they can use force to go in and make them. Absolutely. Which would most likely only happen if Iran didn't comply, not the other countries. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next.